I want to summarize how my uh, NDEs and STEs that I had in medical school and as a medical resident um, impacted my life and my medical practice, and it was profoundly. Um, and some of you may know who heard some of my other talks, I've had a total of five near-death experiences over the course of my life. And uh, my NDEs and multiple STEs uh, propelled me to uh, specialize my practice ultimately in counseling patients with STEs. And I was doing that for close to 40 years. And I talk about that in my book, which is just released this week, just came out on Monday, Touched by the Light, Exploring Spiritually Transformative Experiences. So enough of my book pitch, and let me tell you my personal story. So when I was in medical school, um, I was very, very focused on my medical studies. I was a top student, and I was trying to get very good marks. And somebody offered a meditation course that they said would help you with your exam performance, that if you meditated using these techniques, that you would get better marks on your, you would study more efficiently, and you'd get better marks on your exam. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, let me try this out and see if it'll help me do well in my exams, because um, final med school exams is pretty stressful for all medical students. So um, I took this course, and I started meditating regularly. I found that I took to med meditation very um, well. It was like a duck being introduced to water. I was very comfortable meditating. I really loved it. And a few months after I started meditating in December of 1976, all of a sudden I had this profound experience when I was meditating. I now know that it was a kundalini awakening, but when I was in medical school, I had no idea what this was. And so while I was meditating in an auditorium perhaps this size, I suddenly heard a loud roaring sound and I felt a distinct sensation of energy rising up my body and then it was like my consciousness floated out of my body and expanded. And what I think of as me, I expanded to the size of the auditorium and I was above myself and I was also transformed into this powerful field of love. I felt this incredible, beautiful love. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, no wonder people like to meditate. Because <laughs> I thought that I'd finally gotten my technique right and that this was happening to everybody else when they meditated. And I was a little bit embarrassed. You know, here am I, this top A-plus student. And it took me this long to figure out how to meditate, right? Um, but then I was a bit and it ended when my meditation ended, but I was a bit surprised I was not able to duplicate this on future meditations. And I also noticed that I started having sort of after effects. I was getting these rushes of energy up my spine. I was hearing these inner sounds. But you know, I was in medical school. I was really focused on my exam. So I kept on meditating and I sort of ignored this, pushed it to the back of my mind. Well, spirit had other plans. I couldn't ignore what was going on with me. Uh, two and a half years later, when I was completing my residency, um, I had another profound experience. Now I know it was a near-death experience. But at the time, again, I had no clue what this was. So this was 1979, and in Canada, certainly University of Toronto where I was, nobody had even heard of near-death experiences. So, uh, so I was on a medevac flight in a small airplane with a critically ill patient, and I was tending to the patient. We, we, it was a small twin engine an aircraft called a Piper Aztec. We flew into bad weather in winter in northern Ontario. The ice filters, they say, of both of the propeller engines froze over and the plane crashed. The pilot managed to, rather than crashing into the trees, get us into uh, sort of a crash landing onto the surface of a semi-frozen lake. The plane sl slid across the ice, and then as soon as it came to a stop, the weight of the plane broke the ice and the plane sank. And um, the pilot, the nurse, and myself managed to get out of the plane. The patient, unfortunately, died and went down with the plane. And in the course of 
uh, this experience, I had what we now know is a very powerful white light type of mystical experience. And just because time is short, I'll just capsulize it. I describe it in a lot more detail in my books. So basically, I, I, uh, as it started, the feeling of peace and calm, and then I heard verses from the Bible in my mind, be still and know that I am God. And then as I was struggling to swim to shore, because we, we had landed by open water, I had to swim quite a distance to get to shore. Um, I almost drowned and almost froze en route. Somewhere en route, I went out of body. I heard a whoosh. And suddenly I found myself above my body looking down. Actually, it was more like my consciousness was two places at the same time. 90% of my consciousness was up and I moved into a realm of light and there was still this little bit of my consciousness that was in my physical body trying to swim to shore. I, I compare it to a split screen TV. So it was like my consciousness was somehow both places at once. This was the most profoundly beautiful experience I'd ever had. The love was phenomenal. And now, as we know, these are symptoms of, of near-death experiences. I absolutely was certain my spirit would live on after death. I absolutely lost my fear of death. I absolutely knew the higher power was real because I was experiencing it. And then afterwards, my consciousness returned to my body after I was rescued, brought by helicopter to the local hospital, uh, put in the hot whirlpool baths to reheat my body, which was profoundly hypothermic. And I heard whoosh again. But this time, it was like I was being sucked back into my body through the top of my head. So this is all the final year of my residency. <laughs> I look at it now while I was completing my worldly medical training, spirit was giving me my STE training. <laughs> and about um, three or four weeks after this is when I had my psychic awakening, which we now know is a common after effect from NDEs. But I was driving home from work one night and I was stopped at a stoplight and all of a sudden I got a visual image in my mind's eye of my friend's brain, the friend I was about to visit, my friend's brain covered in pus. And to me as a medical doctor, it was immediately clear that this was a symbol for meningitis. So to make a long story short, yes, my friend later on that evening was diagnosed with meningitis and fortunately went to the eMERGE, was appropriately uh, treated um, and did just fine afterwards. But that was my very first clairvoyant experience. So I started having clairvoyant, clairsentient, clairaudient experiences after that. I'm still a medical resident. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so. I struggled a lot to try and find names for these experiences that were happening to me. I didn't even have words to call them. I didn't know what label to put on them. Uh, when I talked to people in my meditation group and I talked about what I now know as it was a kundalini awakening, I was told very adamantly that it was definitely not a kundalini awakening. Well, oh, okay, it was not a kundalini. I was evidently too young and too inexperienced and you had to have been meditating for 40 years or something in the Himalayas before it could possibly be a kundalini awakening. So, okay, I didn't know any better. Uh, then when I was asking about my near-death experience, when I I spoke with some of my medical colleagues when I was went back to work and I was trying to find a name for what had happened to me in this plane crash. I spoke with my medical colleagues and my medical supervisors because I was still a resident. I spoke with some of the staff physicians. And I remember they all knew me and they knew I was a, um, you know, a sort of an A plus student, a, a high performing physician. So nobody postulated that I was crazy, but everybody had a hallucination theory why I had had a hallucination. So, you know, one physician said that I had hallucinated because of a low blood sugar. And another physician said I'd hallucinated because of an of a electrolyte imbalance. And then the third physician said, oh, you clearly hallucinated because of a direct effect of cold on the brain. And none of that resonated with me. None of that rang true with me. Like as a physician myself, I'd seen many people with these conditions, but I'd not heard anybody talk about a powerful, transforming, experiential experience. And, and so I'm just looking at the time here. Um, so similarly, when I went and I spoke with somebody who called themselves an NDE expert, um, I was told it was not a near-death experience. And I was told it was not a near-death experience because I had never been clinically dead. 
which was true. I had never been clinically dead during the experience. And also because I had not seen a tunnel. And no, I had not seen a tunnel. So now we know that's nonsense, but back then I didn't know any better. So I thought, okay, if it's not a kundalini awakening and if it's not a near-death experience, what is it? Like, what is it that's happening to me? So I developed this private life. I, I literally went into the closet spiritually, and I had these two portions of my life. So there was my medical career, because I ended up getting a teaching position at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine. I was promoted many, many times. So there was this, this world of people knew me as this, this competent doctor and teaching physician. And then there was my private life, where I was meditating regularly. I was researching mystical experiences, kundalini awakenings, psychic awakenings, near-death experiences. I'm going to move quickly here. But during my time in the closet, more and more patients seemed to have found me that there was this doctor in Toronto who would listen to you if you've had some sort of unusual experience. So I developed more and more experience talking to people who'd had all sorts of spiritually transformative experiences. And I was absolutely horrified by the stories people were telling me of how they'd been mislabeled and mistreated and told by their doctors that they were crazy, that they, some of them put on medications, some of them put in psychiatric wards, some some of them getting electroshock therapy, some people telling me by their clergy being told it was work of the devil. I just, it was really horrifying me. Then in 1990, and I'm going to go through this very quickly so that the other physicians have a time to tell their story, I had a very strong, so this is now over 10 years later, I had a very strong calling experience where I knew it was time to come out of the closet. I needed to advocate for patients because I knew by my own personal experience and by my clinical experience that I developed over these 10 years and by the research I'd been doing in the literature for all these years, years. These experiences are real. They are not crazy. So I became a co-founder in 1990 of the Kundalini Research Network. I became the Canadian coordinator for the Spiritual Emergence Network. In 1992, I founded the Spiritual Emergence Research and Referral Clinic, and I sent out a notice to all the doctors of Ontario, inviting them to refer patients to me who'd had, and I gave them the whole list, you know, mystical experiences, past life recall, near-death experiences, psychic awakenings, and the patients came. The patients came flooding. And later on, I, I coined the term spiritually transformative experiences in my book and also in a Journal of Near-Death Studies article. So finally, Jan wants to know, did my worldview change by having NDEs and STEs? A hundred percent. Because I knew that spiritual experiences were real. I knew that the higher power was real. And even though that was not in the current medical paradigm, I saw that as a deficiency of the current medical paradigm. So yes, my NDEs and STEs did change my worldview. They changed my medical practice and um, propelled me to become the first Canadian medical doctor to specialize in counseling people with NDEs and other STEs. And I've been committed to advocating for experiencers since 1990, and I continue to do that to this day.